Well, dear friends, I invite you to turn once again with me today uh, to the book of Acts. We have been studying the book of Acts for a number of months. And our study today brings us to the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. But we begin our scripture reading in verse 23. Acts 19, verse 23. If you are using one of our maroon Bibles, this can be found on page 955. Page 955 in our maroon Bibles. If you were with us last Lord's Day, you may recall that we looked at the earlier verses of Acts 19, considering the theme, the seven sons of Siva. You may recall that the seven sons of Siva were using the name of Jesus sort of as a lucky charm uh, to try to cast out demons. And because they were not in Christ, these demons overpowered them. Uh, this demon-possessed man overpowered them, and, um, and the, the impact in the community was profound. Uh, many realized the power of the name of Jesus. Uh, they burned their scrolls. They forsook their sorcery and the like. And many came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, the context, uh, the immediate context of our scripture reading is found in verse 22 of Acts 19. There we read, He, that is the Apostle Paul, sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. So, Paul is in Asia. Specifically, we're going to look at the city of Ephesus, and he's continuing to minister there. That's where our scripture reading picks up in verse 23, and we read to the end of the chapter, verse 41. But let us hear then the word of the Lord, beginning in Acts 19, verse 23. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion, since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, 
Several years ago, I was traveling down Route 3 East on my way to Newark Airport in northern New Jersey. When I saw a car pulled off to the side in front of the entryway to what is known as the Holy Face Monastery. I saw a man standing there and I thought that perhaps he was having car trouble until I realized that he actually had his hands folded and his head bowed and he was standing there in reverent silence before what I suppose was, was a large statue of Jesus. Think about that. If that man had some kind of spiritual yearning or religious interest or some kind of spiritual need some 2,000 years ago, he would have most likely winded his way to Ephesus and entered the temple of Artemis. Artemis was a, an idol in very grotesque fashion, a multi-breasted goddess of fertility, the historians tell us. And the worship of Artemis, which took place in the temple of Artemis, was mostly character, characterized by gross immorality and cult prostitution. The temple itself was huge. If you can imagine a temple some 400 feet long and some 200 feet wide. The boys and girls and some of the young people may know that that is larger than a modern day NFL football field, including the end zones, including the end zones. The Temple of Artemis, in fact, was four times larger than the Greek Pantheon in Athens. Think about this. Now, as we studied a few weeks ago, in Ephesus, the harbor, it was a commercial center, the harbor had begun getting filled with silt and dirt and rocks. And that impacted the utility of the harbor. And that greatly impacted, in turn, the commercial prosperity of the city of Ephesus. And so as Ephesus commercially was on the downgrade, that temple of Artemis became even more critical to the economic well-being of the city. And they did so by the many tourists who came and had to pay a fee to go into the temple and because of the various trinkets that they sold to those tourists and to those worshipers of Artemis. In fact, it was so successful that one historian that I read said that the, the uh, temple of Artemis became the leading bank in the entire province of Asia. Think of it. Now, friends, considering that spiritual and economic climate, imagine the impact which it had on that city when the Apostle Paul came preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Imagine the impact of Paul preaching the words that Jesus spoke in John 4, 24, namely, that God is spirit, and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Imagine if Paul preached in Ephesus what he was preaching in Athens. If you care to flip back a few pages with me to Acts chapter 17. If you want to just listen, that's okay. But turn back otherwise a couple of pages to Acts 17. Paul is in the Areopagus in Athens on Mars Hill, as it says. And in verse 24 of Acts 17, Paul preached to them, notice verse 24 of Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Drop down to verse 29, same chapter, please. Paul continued, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. Now, friends, imagine that gospel being preached in Ephesus in that economic and spiritual climate. Is it any wonder, then, that the artisans and the craftsmen and the tradesmen of that city, who are making their living from the worship of Artemis, got so furious and so angry that they literally started a riot in an attempt to try to stop the true gospel from going forth because it would undermine the propagation of their false idolatry? Think about that. The impact that the Christians had on that city economically was amazing. 
Interestingly enough, I came across a quote by the late Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, who's commenting on our, this portion of our text. Dr. Boyce writes this. He said, let me suggest that if our Christianity is not affecting the economy of our world, we do not have much Christianity. Isn't that an incredible statement? Think about that. James Boyce, let me suggest that if our Christianity is not affecting the economy of our world, we do not have much Christianity. Very convicting statement indeed. But friends, as we bring this information of the context back to the words of our text, we find ourselves being challenged by the fact that just as was true for the Apostle Paul some 2,000 years ago in the city of Ephesus, so too for each and every one of us here today. As you and I bear witness for the gospel of Christ, as you and I take our stands in an increasingly evil culture for Christ, great opposition is going to arise against us, just as it arose against Paul and the early apostles in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. In fact, one, po one pastor that I read recently has so wisely said, and I quote, listen carefully, please. He said, a movement of God always involves two armies, the human and the divine. A movement of God always invites the opposition of two enemies, the human and the demonic, end of quote. And that's true. But friends, let us not despair. As we continue on in the study of our text, we find ourselves very encouraged and comforted by the fact that just as was true for Paul 2,000 years ago, so too for each and every one of God's children also here today. Those who by God's grace alone repent of their sins and profess faith in Christ alone. You and I are being held in the hollow of the hand of a sovereign God. As we said a few moments ago during the prayer, our times are in His hands. And the Lord promises to protect His people each and every day of their lives according to His will and good pleasure, just as He did Paul 2,000 years ago. Even at those times when you and I may be facing or may be confronted by the equivalent, the equivalent of the adulation of Artemis, the adulation of Artemis. Now, boys and girls, adulation is a big word. And adulation essentially means excessive admiration or praise. And so the theme of our study today is the adulation of this goddess named Artemis. Now, as we go through the words of our text, we're going to seek to glean three key principles that very practically and powerfully will assist us in our own witness for the cause of Christ. And they are also, friends, three principles which will enable us to gain the victory over our own struggle against the sin of idolatry. The first principle our text teaches us is that just as is true for every form of idolatry in, in, in whatever function or form it's taking, is that the adulation of Artemis was driven by deception. It was driven by deception. And friends, as we begin working our way through, remember that definition we read a few moments ago together in the Heidelberg Catechism from question and answer 95. What is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts, in place of or alongside of the one true God who has revealed himself in his word. Okay, that's idolatry. All idolatry is driven by deception. For example, look at verse 23 of our text with me, if you would please, Acts 19. About that time, when all this was going on with the seven sons of Siva, and people are burning their scrolls and forsaking their sorcery and confessing their sins, that's the context. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Now, boys and girls, young people, note that in Paul's day, Christians were often referred to as the way. And the reason probably was because of what Jesus said in John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the early Christian community was often referred to as the way. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis. If you've got a King James Bible, I believe your version may say Diana. That was the Roman equivalent of uh, the Greek Artemis. But the original Greek uses the word Artemis, so we stay with that term. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. Now, friends, we don't know exactly what these shrines of Artemis were like. We don't know if they made miniature uh, forms of this uh, idol Artemis. 
Uh, we don't know if they imprinted her image on coins and sold the coins. We don't know if they made little miniature uh, scale models of the temple itself. Uh, or maybe they did all three. We don't know for sure. But we just know that they made these shrines of Artemis and it brought in a whole lot of money. Verse 25. He called them, Demetrius called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. In other words, many of them became believers. Uh, many of them uh, became believers here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. Now, friends, as Paul is preaching the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, it ought not to surprise us that so many in Ephesus in this idolatrous culture were coming to faith in Christ. And the reason is because of the power of the Word of God. In fact, if you want to just listen, that's okay. But otherwise, turn back with me just for a moment, please, to the Old Testament, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. It's page 636. If you're using a maroon Bible, page 636 in the Old Testament, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. Notice here what Isaiah says about the power of the Word of God. Isaiah 55, verse 10, page 636. Isaiah is speaking the word of the Lord, and it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's why. Paul says in much more succinct fashion in Romans 10, verse 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. And so as Paul is preaching the gospel here in Ephesus, many came to a saving knowledge of the Savior. And so you say, all glory be to God, all glory be to God. They're, they're being drawn away from their false idol worship. Well, friends, that's not how Demetrius saw it. <laughs> Demetrius was not saying all glory be to God. He had a completely different diametrically opposed view of what was happening here. And so look at verse 26 of, verse, uh, of Acts 19 with me. You see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. Think about that. You'd say, well, do you think? <laughs> he, he says, Paul is saying these gods made by human hands are no gods. And he's saying that in a, in a condescending, critical, accusing way of Paul. But you think how ridiculous that statement is. In fact, Matthew Henry, the great Puritan preacher, Bible commentator, says this on that statement. Matthew Henry says, could any truth be more plain and self-evident than this, that gods made by human hands are no gods at all? Could any truth be more plain and self-evident than this. But still in all, even after making such a ridiculous uh, self, you know, falsifying statement, uh, Demetrius isn't done. Look at verse 27 with me, please. He continues, There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now, friends, think of the shrewd wisdom, the shrewd, seductive wisdom of what Demetrius has just said to what may have been hundreds of, of artisans and craftsmen that were making their living by this idolatrous worship. Think of the wisdom of what he's saying in a seductive way. He, first of all, appeals to their greed. He says, hey, guys, we are making a lot of money from this temple and from the worship of Artemis. And he lays that out there. And what was the effect of that? It created in them, it fostered in them a growing greed, which the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 4 is idolatry in and of itself. Greed is idolatry. And then he bathes this covetousness which he has fostered and watered with sort of this, this pagan public pride that we don't want to have this happen to our, our temple and our citizens and in our, in our city. And think of the impact that that had, as we'll see in just a moment, a virtual riot erupted when he said that. Friends, do you see any parallels, however, to the way Demetrius tried to manipulate those artisans to foster the sin of idolatry, the worship of an idol? 
with the way in which you and I are continually bombarded by modern day advertising in the USA today? What are some of the themes of modern day advertising? Look out for number one. The old Burger King thing, it's amazing how stuff sticks with you. When I was a little boy, they, Burger King had a, had a slogan, uh, you deserve a break today. Have it your way. All about modern day advertising basically is communicating the message that it's all about you. And it's all about me. And if you will simply buy this product, if you will wear those clothes, if you will uh, drive that car, if you will drink this beverage, if you will look this way or live in that place, You'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and everyone will envy you because it's all about you. That's the message you and I are bombarded with each and every day. And friends, that is a satanic lie. That is a satanic lie. Because life ultimately is not about you. Life ultimately is not about me. Life ultimately is not about us. It is about Him. It is about Him. It is about Him the one true living creator God who loved us so much that he sent Christ to die on the cross to save us from our sins. I love that first question and answer in the Westminster Larger Catechism, which so eloquently states, and I quote, what is the chief and highest end of man? Think about that question. How would you answer it if I were to ask us each individually that today? What is the chief and highest end of man? In other words, why are you here? Why are we here? What would your answer be? What would my answer be? Westminster Larger Catechism, question answer one, says this so eloquently. Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him forever. I love that. It's so true. Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him forever. And friends, that is why, if you're in Acts with me, just flip several pages to the right to Romans chapter 11, page 975, page 975, Romans 11, 36. Paul breaks out in this glorious doxology of praise to God, Romans 11, verse 36, page 975, and he says, For from Him, and through Him, and for Him, or to Him, are all things. To Him be the glory forever." Amen. All glory be to God. Just as is true for each and every form and function of idolatry today, so too the adulation of Artemis was driven by deception. It was driven by deception. Now, friends, let's go back to our text in Acts 19 together, where we find a second key principle which we glean from the uh, considering this adulation of Artemis, and that is that their passion was misplaced. The, the idol worshipers, their passion was misplaced. And that's true of all forms of idolatry. Look at verse 28 with me, if you would please, Acts 19. When they heard this, when these artisans heard what Demetrius had said, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Imagine perhaps hundreds of people shouting this in the middle of the city. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. That theater was actually an amphitheater, which excavations tell us could have held up to 25,000 people. Think of this. That's about half what I think Yankee Stadium holds, about 50,000. So it would be about half the capacity of Yankee Stadium today in New York City. That's how much that amphitheater, that theater held. So it was huge. They all rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Stay with me. Even some of the officials of the province, in your mind's eye, put brackets around those uh, four words, officials of the province. In the original language, in the Greek, it's a single word. Asiarchs, Asiarchs, Asiarchs. I looked up the definition of an Asiarch. What are the Asiarchs? The Asiarchs, the, the Greek lexicon says, were people who were selected each year from the noblest and most wealthy families of the province and who were especially devoted to the promotion of Rome along with its cult of emperor worship. Those are the Asiarchs. They're called here the, the officials of the province. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Because in effect, a riot was taking place. Verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing and some another. 
Most of the people did not even know why they were there. I mean, Paul says that almost sarcastically or ironically, because a lot of people didn't even know what was going on. They didn't even know why they were there. But they were joining in this tumult. Verse 33. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front. Now, friends, if you're familiar with the New Testament, that is a name which occurs in various places, Alexander. We don't know if it's the same Alexander whom Paul references in 1 Timothy 1.20 and 2 Timothy 4.14, who he says caused him a great deal of harm and whom he handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. We don't know if it's the same Alexander. That was 1 Timothy 1.20, 2 Timothy 4.14, but we know his name was Alexander. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, well, what difference would that make? Well, the difference is as a Jew, they would know he's not going to be into the worship of Artemis. And so they wanted no part of anything he had to say. When they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Think of it, they shouted that for two hours. Wow. Well, friends, put yourself back there in that time and place. And you're in the midst of all these people shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. And if I was there, I would have a, a feeling which convicted me. And it would convict me in this way. You think of that beautiful word, a Hebrew word, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay with me in your mind's eye here. Halal is a Hebrew verb meaning to praise. That little you is the first person plural suffix ending, us. And the Yah is short for Yahweh, the covenant making, covenant keeping God of Israel. So when you say hallelujah, you're saying let us praise the Lord or let us praise the Lord. Would you shout that for two hours? <laughs> Would I shout that for two hours? Probably not. But that begs another question. Do you and I, when we come to worship here or anywhere, do we bring more energy or do we bring more apathy? Do we bring more energy or do we bring more apathy? They all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, this week, I have to, this coming week, I have to travel to New Jersey and go to a New Jersey motor vehicle, which is always an experience in and of itself. But I, I have to go on behalf of my 93, nearly 94 year old father. I'm his power of attorney, his POA, and I have to do something with the title on his car. So I was thinking about the times I've been in New Jersey Division of Motor Vehicle, and now it's called New Jersey uh, Motor Vehicle Commission. And for my young friends, the boys and girls, I, I was there several years ago and I'm in line and there's a young man in front of me, picture this, he's in line in front of me, young man, and he's got on a black t-shirt. And the back of the black t-shirt, it looks like it's covered in blood. It wasn't, but it was red like blood. It was all dripping, red color. And in the middle of that red dripping color on the back of his black t-shirt, there's a name in four to six inch letters. And the name is Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson. I did a little research on Marilyn Manson. Apparently he got the name from Marilyn Monroe's first name and Charles Manson, the cult leader, mass murderer's last name. And he called himself Marilyn Manson. And for those of you that don't know, Marilyn Manson is a very degenerate, if not demonic, heavy metal rock star. I'm looking at that young man with the heavy metal name of Marilyn Manson on his shirt. Big letters. You could see it from 15 feet away. And I was actually convicted by that. You know why? Here's this young man who's telling the world that he is of Marilyn Manson. He's a Marilyn Manson follower. For all I know, he's a Marilyn Manson worshiper. Idolatry. And along with many other millions of people in our own country and in our own culture who worship, in effect worship, sports stars or singers or movie stars or, or rock stars. And they not only wear their names on their shirts, sometimes they tattoo the name on their body. <laughs> They're proud of the ones they esteem or extol, they adulate. And I said to myself, 
Why is it then that we as Christians, so many of us, and I am including myself in this, can go through life without anybody even knowing that we're a Christian? We like to fly under the radar, <laughs> as they say. Keep our heads down and our mouths shut. And friends, let's be honest, that is increasingly becoming tempting for you and me and what is increasingly becoming a cancel culture. You stand for Christ. You stand for biblical morality, views of marriage and the family. They will try to finish you off and erase you as if you never existed. You will not be able to have a voice. There's an old gospel hymn that is so pertinent to this portion of our text. And the words go like this. Listen carefully, please. The sacred songwriter wrote, saying, Lord Jesus, can it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee? Ashamed of thee whom angels praise, whose glory shine through endless days? Ashamed of Jesus, soon or far, let evening blush to own a star. He sheds the beams of light divine or this benighted soul of mine. Ashamed of Jesus, just as soon, let midnight be ashamed of noon. Tis midnight with my soul till he, bright morning star, bids darkness flee. Ashamed of Jesus, that dear friend, on whom my hopes of heaven depend? No, when I blush, be this my shame that I no more revere his name. Wow. Convicting. May God grant us such grace to his glory. Think of it once again, verse 34b. They all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, just as is true for every other manifestation of idolatry today, the adulation of Artemis was also characterized by a passion which was misplaced. A passion which was misplaced. Well, friends, a third and final key principle which we glean from the adulation of Artemis is that even though such idolatrous worship was, was uh, driven by deception and was characterized by misplaced passion, still in all, you and I could be encouraged and comforted by the fact that the truth will ultimately triumph. The truth will ultimately triumph triumph. For example, look at verse 35 of our text with me, if you would, please. Here it says, the city clerk, the grammatos, the, the Greek says, I have a footnote here in my study Bible, which defines it as the secretary of the city who pub published the decisions of the civic assembly. He was the most important local official and the chief executive officer of the assembly, acting as a go-between for Ephesus and the Roman authorities. The grammatos, the city clerk, quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Now friends, think about that. Think about that. Doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Some researchers say that because the Ephesians didn't actually know how the worship of Artemis started, they just spread the rumor that she fell from heaven. Other biblical scholars say that the reason that this uh, city clerk said that we all know that she uh, fell from heaven was because perhaps a meteorite had fallen into that, that region of modern-day Turkey, really, is where Ephesus was. And that as they looked at that rock, they thought they saw this grotesque female form of, of, of this idol. And so they said, well, she fell from heaven. And that's not actually unthinkable. Several years ago, some of us may recall, in northern New Jersey, they were, uh, there was a county a work crew clearing uh, brush and taking down trees along a highway. And all of a sudden, the traffic started backing up and large crowds of people started <laughs> to gather and it was because they thought they saw a, a, a uh, they thought they saw the Virgin Mary in the stump of a tree that, that they had cut down. And people started worshiping the tree. And it backed up traffic on the highways. And so maybe that's where they got this from, that, that maybe there's a meteorite. We don't know for sure. We only know what he said. That we all know that her image fell from heaven. Verse 36. Therefore, 
Since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. Notice the language. Since these facts are undeniable. Someone has once said that if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough, everybody will begin to believe it. And that's true today. Consider the satanic lie. Well, that's not a baby in the womb of that woman. That's not a baby. Say that loud enough and long enough. What do you end up with? 60 plus million abortions. Think of it. Winston Churchill once said, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And so city clerk just declares, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. The proconsuls were provincial governors. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. And friends, we need to thank God for the courts historically of our land, the legal assemblies of our country, the judicial branch. Praise God for that. But we also need to increasingly pray for the judicial branch and the legal system in our country because it is falling seemingly farther and farther away from true justice and righteousness and holiness, according to the word of the Lord. And you say, may God have mercy. May God have mercy. But they had a legal system. The city clerks say, Demetrius can appeal to that. Verse 40, as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Whole thing thrown out of court. Just as has happened, by the way, as we studied previously in Acts 18, when charges were brought against Paul in Corinth and Galileo, the uh, proconsul of Achaia, threw it out of court. Threw it out of court. You say, how could this happen in two different places where God's people are being accused and they don't end up being persecuted in any way? Well, the answer is found in Proverbs 21, verse 1, at least in part. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. I love that text. Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. And so the city clerk threw it out of court. All glory be to God in the ministry continued. Glory be to God. Well, you know, friends, as we close, uh, I just want you to know that the uh, archaeologists have uncovered the ruins of the temple of Artemis. Again, in modern day Turkey. Think of this. Once one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And there's hardly a stone left on top of another in fact, there's hardly many stones there at all. Do you know anybody today who stands for hours chanting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians? <laughs> Do you know anybody who worships Artemis today at all? And yet here we are, gathered for worship along with many millions of other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ scattered throughout this country and scattered throughout the world, some of them again doing it under threat of intense persecution, arrest, imprisonment at the very cost of their lives, worshiping the God who created us through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, the God who one day we will also have to give an account. Why is that so? Why virtually no worshipers of Artemis today? And countless millions of worshipers of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How could that possibly be? <laughs> well, friends, the reason is because all idolatry is driven by deception. Its worshipers are marked by misplaced passion. And in the end, the truth will ultimately triumph. We learn these three key principles from our careful and prayerful consideration of the adulation of Artemis. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. Oh, our mighty God and most merciful Heavenly Father, some 2,500 years ago, you spoke through the prophet Habakkuk saying, 
Of what value is an idol? Since a man has carved it. Or an image that teaches lies. For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And Heavenly Father, having considered this sin of idolatry, which the Ephesians battled and which we battle today, we're going to take a few moments to be silent before you and to silently confess our sins to you, including our own sins of idolatry and our own violations of the third commandment of your law. Hear us, Father, as silently we pray. Heavenly Father, we also desire silently in prayer to claim the cleansing of all such sin through the blood of Christ shed on Calvary's cross. And Lord, we claim that cleansing solely by your grace, unmerited favor, solely through faith in your name. And Father, if there are any here today who came into worship not being able to claim that cleansing through the name of Christ, Bring them from spiritual death to spiritual life, even in this hour of worship. And grant them the gift of saving, soul-cleansing faith in His name as we claim that cleansing silently in prayer. And now, Father... As we leave this place, by your grace, consecrate us for sacred service and make us bold witnesses for the cause of Christ, unashamed of him who is not ashamed to die for us. Hear us, Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>